Ja, schön, dass Sie hier sind und Sie verzeihen, noch schöner, dass Tüdo Nen da ist. <lacht> Welcome, Stuart, third time here. I'm very glad. Ja, wir haben eine, einen starken Mai, einen starken internationalen Mai vor uns. Wir sind ja noch am, am Beginn. Am Montag etwa wird die tschechische Schriftstellerin Radka Denemakova ihren großen China-Roman Stunden aus Blei hier vorstellen, aufgrund äh, dessen äh, sie nicht mehr nach China einreisen kann. Morgen Sascha Filipenko aus Belarus, der nicht mehr nach Belarus kann aktuell, der äh, durch seine Kritik am Diktator Lukaschenka äh, unterwegs ist, in der Schweiz war, in Deutschland, also sehr schwierig, auch mit seiner Familie, mit den Kindern. Äh, ja, der wird morgen seinen neuen Roman Die Jagd vorstellen, ein, ein Buch, wo ein Oligarch sehr brutal, aber vor allem auch psychologisch sehr gefinkelt Jagd auf einen kritischen Journalisten macht. Und heute freue ich mich sehr, dass Dürer Nein da ist, er ist zum dritten Mal bei uns, 2006, Entschuldigung, 2009, 2016 und eben heute. Er hat äh, zuerst Song, äh, vorgestellt Songs for the Missing. Ähm, dieses Buch heißt auf Deutsch Alle, alle lieben dich. Und äh, das finden Sie wie andere auch Originalbücher draußen am Büchertisch der Robertos Buchhandlung. 2016 äh, warst du dann ein hier mit West of Sunset. Deutsch westlich des Sunset. Vielleicht waren Sie auch hier. Ja, und heute Ocean State. Und da muss ich jetzt keinen deutschen Titel suchen, denn äh, hier ist der Titel Ident. Ocean State, der neue, großartige Roman von Studio 9. Ich freue mich sehr, dass er hier ist. Again, welcome. Peter Ab wird auf Deutsch lesen, wie schon das letzte Mal. Und wie das letzte Mal wird moderieren, so ist fast eine Familienaufstellung. <lacht> Wolfgang Görtschacher, herzlich willkommen, ihr drei. Schönen Abend. Schönen Abend, ich darf Sie auch sehr herzlich begrüßen. Thomas hat eigentlich meine Einleitung schon vorweggenommen. Ähm, Stuart Online hat eine sehr treue und, und große Leserschaft. Äh, wie ich äh, einem Freund bekannt gegeben habe, dass Thomas äh, mich engagiert hat, die wieder diesen Abend moderieren zu dürfen, die erste Reaktion war, das ist ganz, ganz toll, endlich kommt Stuart Online wieder nach Salzburg und äh, er, wird, er wird zusammen mit seiner Mutter kommen, sie sind große Fans. Uh, Stuart O'Neill wurde 1961 in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania geboren. Er wuchs in Boston auf. Er arbeitete als Flugzeugingenieur, das habe ich ganz besonders faszinierend gefunden, uh, von der Boston University 1983, die Graduation. Er studierte dann Literaturwissenschaft an der Cornell University, unterrichtete anschließend an mehreren Universitäten. Er hat bisher 19 Romane geschrieben. Er hat begonnen mit einem Band von Kurzgeschichten. Und sein 19. Buch eben Ocean State, das heute im Zentrum unseres Abends sein wird. Und äh, was ich auch ganz spannend finde, ist, äh, er hat auch zwei Sachbücher publiziert. Und zwar The Circus Fire, A True Story of an American Tragedy, äh, 2009 eben von einem Zirkusbrand in Hartford. Und eines, das ich besonders als jemand, der Sport sehr nahe steht, der Sport sehr lange ausgeübt hat. Das Buch heißt Faithful, das er gemeinsam mit Stephen King geschrieben hat. Und da geht es um die Boston Red Sox Season von 2004, 2003. Und eben Baseball ist einer seiner Sportarten, die die Studio nein besonders, besonders mag. Ich würde vorschlagen, wir beginnen gleich mit dem Beginn des Buches, das erste Abschnitt. Stuart, may I ask you to, to start reading the very beginning of the novel? This first section is called In the House by the Line and Twine. When I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. She was in love, my mother said, like it was an excuse. She didn't know what she was doing. I had never been in love then, not really, so I didn't know what my mother meant, but I do now. This was in Ashaway, Rhode Island, outside Westerly, down along the shore. That fall, we lived in a house by the river, 
across the road from the mill where my grandmother had met my grandfather. The line in Twine was closed, posted with rusty no trespassing signs, but just above the dam, someone had snipped a hole in the fence with bolt cutters so you could sneak in the back. We used to roller skate up and down the aisles between the dusty looms, angel weaving, teaching me how to do crossovers and go backwards. She could do spins like an ice skater, her hands making shapes in the air. I wanted to do spins and be graceful like her, but I was chubby and a klutz, and when I stood beside her in church, I was invisible. My mother said I shouldn't worry, that in time I'd find my special talent. I was a late bloomer, she said, as if that was supposed to be comforting to me. What if I didn't have a special talent, I wanted to ask. What if a hopeless nerd was all I'd ever be? My mother's talent was finding new boyfriends and new places for us to live. She worked as a nurse's aide at the Elms, an old folks' home in Westerly, where my great aunt Mildred lived and didn't make any money. Friday, she'd come home and change, brushing her hair out, making up her face, using too much perfume. She'd been a cheerleader and could dance. She dieted or tried to. Facing the narrow mirror on her closet, she complained that nothing fit her anymore. I used to look like you, she told Angel, like a threat. And it was true, in her old pictures, they could have been twins. If she'd wanted to, she said, she could have married a doctor, but they were all assholes. Your father was sweet. We knew our father was sweet. What we didn't understand was when he'd become an asshole, or why. My grandmother had never liked him because he was Portuguese. He tricked my mother into turning Catholic and then abandoned her. Never trust a Portuguese, she said, like it was a joke. I had his dark hair and eyes, so what did that make me? My mother's boyfriends tried to be sweet, but they were strangers. Sometimes they paid our rent and sometimes we split it. When they broke up with my mother, suddenly, drunkenly, their shouting jerking us from sleep, we would have to move again. Like her, we were always rooting for things to work out far beyond where we should have. Our father was gone and our mother couldn't stop wanting to be in love. I swear this is the last time, she'd say, dead sober, and a month later she'd bring home another loser. They seemed to be getting younger and scruffier, which Angel thought was a bad sign. My mother didn't seem to notice. In the beginning, everything was new. She lost weight and kissed us too much and made promises she couldn't keep. The last had been a deckhand named Wes, who brought home lobsters and called her Care and took us to Block Island to ride bikes until one night he smashed her phone when she tried to call the police. Neither of them was bleeding, so the cops didn't charge anyone. You guys are useless, my mother said. Yeah, one of the cops said. That's why we're here at one in the morning, because we've got nothing better to do. We were living in the top half of a duplex, and the next morning, while Wes was out dragging the sound, the three of us lugged everything we could carry down the stairs and shoved it in my mother's car. The house by the line and twine was for sale, but in 2009, no one was going to buy it. My grandmother had worked in accounting with the owners, snowbirds who shipped off to Florida long before the crash. Like most of the houses on River Road, it had been sitting empty for years. There was moss on the shingles and weeds in the gutters. My grandmother came over to help us clean the kitchen. She brought her rubber gloves. It's not the Taj Mahal, she said. It's fine, my mother said, as if we wouldn't be there long. Angel Lynn quit with the face. I didn't say anything, she said, scowling. You don't have to. I didn't say anything. I hardly ever said anything, afraid of making things worse. I watched them like a scorekeeper, silently recording every slight and insult, every failure to be kind. I was 13, and like all children, had an overdeveloped sense of justice. I wanted everyone to be happy, despite our actual lives. First chapter already contains all the most important aspects of the plotline. Uh, the first person narrator, Marie, uh, She's not going to be the only narrator in the book. Sie wird nicht der einzige, die Erzählerin sein im, im Roman. Uh, Stuart O'Neill hat es geschafft, multiperspektivisch zu erzählen. Uh, 
Marie ist die einzige Ich-Erzählerin. Die anderen Erzählerinnen sind immer in der dritten Person. Und ich werde versuchen jetzt zu erörtern mit Stuart, wie er das angeordnet hat und warum er mit einer First-Person-Narrator beginnt, eine erste an Erzählung in the ersten person. Stuart, uh, you've, you've managed to integrate so many pers narrative perspectives. Uh, how come that you decided to have Marie as the first person narrator, the others, uh, her, her, her sister Angel, uh, her lover My Miles is not a narrator. This is also interesting. Uh, Carol, her mother, also third person narrator, and, and of course Birdie, uh, the victim, again a third person narrator. The grandmother has also a certain, a certain go, a certain, a, a certain space. Yeah. Why, how come that you start with a first person narrator, then switch to third person narrator, and then integrate other parts in the first person again? Well, I, I knew the story was going to be um, grim, I guess. It was going to be dark and, and a little cold, I think because of the action. So I wanted some intimacy. I wanted some warmth. Uh, I wanted um, the character who cared the most about what happened that season. That's usually the, the point of view character that you're looking for, whoever cares the most. Um, with, with Marie, she, she's 13 years old. Uh, she idolizes her, her, her sister, who's 18, Angel. Uh, she wants to be like her. Um, it's a, it's a a family that disintegrated. It's more or less, uh, you know, everything is, is, is going wrong to, to, to a certain extent. Uh, I'm, 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 just, I'm just wondering uh, the unreliability of Marie. She, she's a keep of, 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 of certain secrets. She's, she's a, a sneak, she's a spy, she's a liar. Um, and, and yet she, she loves both Angel and her mother, um, and her father as well. Um, I, think, I think all the characters truly do care about one another. They're the most important people um, in their lives. They're the people closest to them, the people they know the most. And, and while they, they sometimes bring them great pain, um, they, they tend to stand by them. Um, it's the only family they know. It's the only love they know. Um, and, and I think that that's a theme throughout the book. Besides the, the, the familial bonds that we're seeing, there's also those romantic bonds. Um, and it's the question of you know, what, what we'll do for love, that need for love, um, and what it makes us do, um, and how it makes us feel. Angel is very much in love with, with Miles. Um, more or less, more, more, more or less, uh, uh, Miles is, is the only character who is, who is up to class, he is, he is, he is very well, well off. Uh, so uh, this kind of romantic, you called it ecstasy, you used the term passion for, for their, their love. Uh, I, I, was, I was just reminded of when I was you know, 14, 15, 16, or 18, it must be very difficult uh, to, you know, to, to more or less impersonate these characters. How, how, no. how, 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 how did you achieve that? No, they're, they're, I think they were easy because they're relatively simple characters. Uh, they, they want the things that we all want. Uh, they, they want love, they want security. Um, they want to be seen and known and desired. Um, I, I would say that an Angel at this point may not be quite in love with Miles the way that Birdie is in love with Miles. Bertie is wildly in love with Miles. Bertie is in love as perhaps only she can be, 17 years old, and is willing to give up everything to have Miles. Miles is everything to her. And Miles really doesn't care that much. Miles is a teenage boy, he's rather callow. Um, he's happy to be with Bertie, he's happy to be with, with Angel. It doesn't really matter that much to him. He's, he's a careless person, as, as Fitzgerald you know, had Nick say of, of Tom and Daisy, they were careless and thoughtless. And what Miles does is he hurts uh, Angel so much that Angel decides that she has to keep him. She has to possess him. Um, Miles really is, is the only good thing in her mind that Angel has. And when it seems that he's being taken away from her, 
um, she fights for him. Um, not perhaps out of love, um, but perhaps out of pain, I think. Um, I think we probably don't give too much away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the first, the first sentence says it all. When I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not a crime novel uh, to the extent that we already know at the very beginning who, who more or less or who was involved in, 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 in the murder. It's, it's more or less an asking of uh, how why and, and who else was involved probably miles and and, and it, it's it's the why but also it, it's it's that that what has led us to this point um how did we get here why did things have to happen this way and marie is looking back for many years later looking at this one season and saying why did this have to happen the way that it did and in in sort of trying to unearth that, trying to understand that and to read the other characters' minds and figure them out, um, it, it turns into a love story. Um, and I think that's why that first paragraph is the way it is. You know, when I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. She was in love, my mother said, as if it was an excuse. She didn't know what she was doing. I didn't know. I'd never been in love then. So I didn't know what she meant, but I do now. And so looking back, she thinks, I can try to understand how love has turned into hate and murder. Yeah. So it's not a crime story, no, no, I always no, say. No. Yeah. It's a love story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would definitely agree with, with the author, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the counterpart in, in the context of love is, is uh, the mother, uh, Carol. And uh, she, she is already described in, in the first chapter uh, what she's after in the context of, of love. And I think this is, this is a, a beautifully drawn, sharp contrast to, to the, the young girls, how they are passionately in, in almost, love. Almost purely, almost yeah, purely yeah, passionate. Yeah. Where Carol being almost middle age, um, she has to see whatever romance that she's in in the context of her larger life. Um, and sometimes the hopelessness of her larger life. You know, her life is not going to change that much at this point, um, but she takes her, her, her love and her, the word for affection, where she can find it, yeah. even though it's not ideal. Yeah. But I, I think in, in both cases, that good question, and I, I come back to this question again and again, and book after book after book, which is sometimes what we desire is not good for us, and sometimes we know it. <laughs> Knowing my own personal background, um, I, I find it fascinating how, how you portray uh, the social issues in, in, in your novels, in, in, in uh, Ocean State in, in, in particular. Uh, the girls have to work. They go to high school, they, they have to work. And the kind of jobs they do in order to support their family and inverted commas is, is, is also interesting. They are they at the low, lower level of, uh, uh, of society and, and uh, this is, I think, beautifully portrayed and very important well, thanks. For, well, for, 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 for the context. It's just, it's just how it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the characters is, is Ocean State. Uh, it's, I would call it Ocean, uh, a character, because oh, the setting uh, Ocean City, Rhode Island, and, and the temple setting is 2009. Uh, could I ask you to, to tell us something about the, the great financial recession the situation in, in Rhode Island, Westerly, and, and, and Ashaway? Well, in, in 2008, with the, the housing market failing, I mean, everyone basically who had a mortgage uh, suddenly you know, the, the mortgage was much more than the house was worth at all. So you couldn't really move anywhere. She couldn't go anywhere there. And in Rhode Island, that was especially true of the people that lived in some of these smaller mill towns, uh, textile mills, where for generations people had worked there and lived there and, and raised their children there. And now there were no jobs at the textile mills. So they were kind of stuck there in a way. And that's what Carol is at this point. She's stuck there. And she's working in an assisted living facility. Mm -hmm. So she's taking care of people that actually have money, uh, but who are in terrible physical shape and are dying mm -hmm. there. Um, and she wonders, who will take care of me when I'm older? 
And the answer is, well, well, no one will, because no one's gonna. Mm -hmm. She's not gonna have the money to do that. She's gonna have to live the way her mother lives, because she had worked in the mill of the grandmother there. So the grandmother is that she's at this point of stability, but also this point of you're never leaving this town. You're never getting out of this town. And Angel sees that and understands that she doesn't have the money to go to college like Miles does. So that as soon as he goes away to college, she's going to lose him. So for this next six months, he is hers. And she is not going to let Bertie take him away there. Um, so they, they have very little means, very little resources, these people. Whereas Miles and his family have lots of money. They have this million dollar house on the beach. And he lives a life of ease. Um, he has these two girls after him. He drives a nice car. He plays guitar. He's very popular in school. He, he's, he's comfortable in a way that they will never, ever be. Uh, William Maxwell said, uh, the great William Maxwell, great writer, um, said, um, the reason life is so strange is that so often people have no choice. And in this case, they not only have no choice because of their lack of resources, but they have very little hope. Uh, Carol doesn't see her life changing that much for the rest of her life. Angel doesn't see a future outside of staying here in town and working at a crappy job, which she already has. Um, and I think Marie is too young at this point to see a future beyond where they are in Ashaway. And I think the same is true with, with Birdie as well. She sees just, she, all she sees is Miles. All she sees is this moment and her chance to, to have this great love and this great romance. And she's totally caught up in it. Which, which is not going to, to last anyway. Uh, well, we, it, we yeah. know that from, yeah, from yeah. the very beginning, yeah. but she doesn't. And, yeah. and her, yeah. her love is, is again, mm -hmm. that, that pure, innocent, wild love that, that takes her over. And she, she thinks, it's turned me into this other mm -hmm. person that I don't understand at all, but I'm still willing to follow it. But you, you always empathize, in, at least in, in, in this novel, with the agents, the people who are active, which is, which is, which is why I... I would argue you probably decided to let them have the say, the female characters, whereas Miles is at the recipient end. I mean, he's, he's at the center of, of admiration, and female admiration, but he isn't, isn't, other than playing the guitar and introducing songs, he's not that active, he's, is he's, he? He's rather, he's a love object. Yeah. He's a love object of the two women um, there, and an unworthy object, I think. Um, and, I, and I think, <laughs> Clearly, Carol, the mother, knows this. Carol knows that Miles is, and she compares him often to her ex-husband, Frank. Uh, and says he's just like Frank, he's gonna end up just like Frank. And Frank, as, as we'll see, um, ends up alone because he did not care enough. So, Miles doesn't care enough. All the other four uh, narrators cared very, very deeply. Very, very deeply. And often the choices they make are not good ones, but they certainly care about them. And they're made out of out of need, I guess. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll skip to read the second excerpt. Thank you. Marie knows she shouldn't eat the whole pizza, but it's hard when there's nothing else to do and it's sitting right behind her on the cutting board, still warm. It's a staple, along with frozen fried chicken and Swanson pot pies, a quick and easy dinner her mother can throw in the oven when she gets home. Normally, Marie splits one with her mother, her angel, whoever doesn't have a date, but some nights, like tonight, they both go out, and she has to eat alone. It's a trap. Tomorrow, her mother will ask if there were any leftovers, making her say it, when all she has to do is look in the fridge. At the least, Marie needs to leave two pieces, which sounds easy, except she's watching TV and every other commercial is for fast food, McDonald's, Taco Bell, until finally, like a sign, an ad runs for Pizza Hut's stuffed crust pizza. No one out pizzas the hut, sending her into the kitchen with her plate. She leaves the two smallest pieces, pulling a loose pepperoni from one edge and resettles herself on the couch. She's a fast eater. Her mother's always telling her to slow down, but there's no one here to watch her now. With both hands, she folds the slice into a V, raises it to her lips, and feeds it into her mouth like a log into a buzzsaw, gobbling bite after greasy bite until her cheeks are filled and she has to breathe through her nose to chew. The pizza is crappy. It's this feeling she loves of being overwhelmed, drowning in sensation. 
The way she feels when she touches herself in the shower, followed by the same shame, the same promises to change, and the inevitable guilt when she gives in again. It's a kind of high she knows is wrong, but can't stop wanting. When you work with so many perspectives, um, I've been wondering uh, how you actually start. Uh, I assume there is a long digestion process, but how do you, do you actually start? Do you sketch out a kind of a super narrative and, and you, you know at the very beginning how it may develop because, of course, it's work in progress. How, how, how do you do work with so many perspectives? Um, usually it's finding the perspective, I think. Um, and this, this is based off an actual murder that happened in Connecticut in 1997 when we were living in Connecticut. Um, it was a young girl, 13 years old. Uh, she had moved to a small town and had no friends. She decided to get in with this group of young people uh, by sleeping with the boys in the group. Uh, the girls in the group did not like that because she was stealing their boyfriends from them. And they convinced the boys to get together and kill her, to get rid of her. And they wrapped her in a blanket and chains and they threw her into the river. Um, and she disappeared. Her mother didn't know what happened to her. Um, and so, that, that story, that actual story, just haunted me. It was terrifying. I mean, at the time, I was a, a father of a teenage girl, um, and I just wondered how did people do that, and, and what did it do to you if you knew that girl, if you were that girl's family, um, if you knew the people that were involved in the killing. And for a long time, I tried to write the book, and I just couldn't figure out a way into the book. And I, I thought it had to do with the mother of the victim, um, or the sister of the victim. And so for years, I would try to write it that way. I'd try to understand all the young people who decided, let's kill this girl. And I just I couldn't get there. I couldn't reach it. It was, it was, it was as Fitzgerald says, it was emotion that, an emotion that I did not understand. I needed an emotion that I understood. Um, and so I started thinking about the sister of one of the girls who had done the killing. Um, a, a younger sister who idolized an older sister um, and found out that she was capable of terrible things. Um, and, and that, that relationship, that, that, that love between the two of them would be changed forever. And the family would be changed forever. And so I, I realized that, that Marie was the right narrator. And once I found Marie's voice, that first person uh, narrator, um, I started writing a sentence that began, that summer they lived in a house by the river. Um, to talk about these two girls um, and their mother in the small town um, and how they're seen by the, the rest of the town as strange and um, off limits, untouchable in a way. And it made me think of Shirley Jackson's great novel, uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, in which Mary Cat, the younger sister, idolizes the older sister um, who is suspected of murder by the rest of the town. So the idea of being these, these outlaws together and how that binds them tighter and tighter there. Um, and, and eventually I realized I had to talk, I, I had to sort of give up that idea of the murder being a secret early on because I didn't like the way that Shirley Jackson had done it um, in her novel. I wanted to be a little bit more above board. I didn't want to play a game with the reader that way. So I changed it to that, that first sense that we have now. There. But no, I, I, once I got that first sentence, I realized, okay, at some point, uh, we have to have the murder. Um, we have to have the consequences of the murder, how it changes the family, um, how they go on from it. Um, and and you'll, you'll see that in, in all those books. What do you do when everything has been taken from you? How do you go on after that? Prayer for the Dying, um, the Fitzgerald book, Snow Angels, Songs for the Missing. In all of those, these people are challenged in their beliefs about themselves and the people closest to them and their lives when everything is taken away. And they have to find some hope, some faith to go forward. And, and where do they get that from? How do they do that? And if they don't do that, that's when the terrible things happen. Uh, when I work, I work in Uni Park um, and, and opposite three, three schools, and when I listen uh, to the kids, uh, 
they, they use a very different register, a very different language. They are interested in, 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 in stuff that you know, I, I wasn't interested when I was very young. We, we both could write about the 60s, and of course Peter as well, 60s, 70s, 80s. But 2009, hey, uh, this is, this is I, I think, very difficult. Uh, I, 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 I read and I, I listened to one of the interviews and, and I think you said you actually bought a, a 2009 um, a yearbook yeah, the high school of, of, yearbook. The, of the yeah. high school yeah. uh, in, in Westerly uh, in order to get to know what these kids were interested in. Yeah. A little more, yeah. 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 What, what were they particularly interested in and, and was that more or less uh, a great source for you? Oh, an amazing source, yeah, because the, the yearbook that I bought was some young woman's and her friends had written you know these very heartfelt sayings in it because they were never going to see each other again they were leaving high school they were leaving town and so the language the feelings were all there and 2009 it's a long time ago really when you think of it now this is 2022 you know the world has changed the world is very different from what it was in 2009 so it was in a sense doing some sort of historical research um, which i think is pretty easy to do nowadays. Uh, the difficult part is I was writing it at the very beginning of COVID, so I didn't have a library uh, available to me. My library was closed. Um, I couldn't go to Rhode Island and do location scouting like I would with a regular book there. Um, but my son graduated from high school in 2007. Um, the editor that I worked with in the U.S. on this graduated from high school in 2011. Um, so I used those, plus the yearbook. The one, one of the great um, finds for me was, that was the year of the first Twilight movie. Um, and so it was, it was Twilight was a, a huge, huge thing there, which makes absolute sense, because what is Twilight but a love triangle with lots of violence and yearning in it, right? Um, plus the soundtrack to the, to the Twilight movie sort of fits in there perfectly, and Beyonce versus Rihanna. Um, so I mean, most of it was, was relatively familiar, uh, but to be able to go back and, and use the actual words of the people you know, from that place um, and time was, was really helpful. And so I used a lot of the actual names of the people from the high school in the high school sections, which I think should be a lot of fun you now if, if they ever read them. <laughs> in the acknowledgments, you thank uh, three people, friends perhaps, uh, for, for uh, improving or, or correcting or whatever uh, the Rhode road Island dialect. Yeah. How, how much rewriting was necessary to integrate that into your novel? Um, the Rhode Island dialect is very different. It's much different from the Massachusetts dialect or the Connecticut dialect. Um, and luckily my, my, my wife's family is from Rhode Island. And so we have all these cousins and uncles and nephews and nieces uh, who could help us out with you know, making sure we got the dialect and the that the small details right, um, because otherwise they should have said it in Connecticut. Um, but yeah, they helped a great, great deal, and their attitudes toward a lot of what's happening around the town, that, 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 that attitude of who actually belongs in town and who doesn't belong in town. Soundtrack. You've just used, used the term. For three of us, we are probably 60s, 70s, 80s people. Now, these, these guys are, are very, very different, and you've mentioned already some uh, songs uh, that, that you refer to in, in the novel. Now, the novel itself is, is dedicated to Angel Olsen and the American singer-songwriter and her, her song High Five which I think thematically fits very well. And, and you use two, two epigraphs uh, you know, from uh, Angel Olsen's songs. Uh, I think you, you, you once said that you always have a soundtrack, a particular soundtrack for every novel. Oh yeah, yeah. Could yeah. we ask you to comment on that? Well, it, it's, it sets the mood. Um, it sets the mood for me, it sets the mood for the characters. Um, and so I'll, I'll play the same records, albums, CDs, whatever, tapes, downloads, uh, again and again and again to keep that mood. You always want to sit, keep that connection, emotional connection uh, with the characters and, and with the setting there. And Angel Olsen and how she writes about romantic love and the, the ecstatic romantic love and then when it goes bad. She's very, very good at that. She's almost a torch singer in a way. 
Um, even though she can write country, she can write pop, she can write almost anything. Uh, but she's so good at that emotion. And it seemed to fit perfectly with, with both Birdie and that Birdie is in the throes of this ecstatic romantic love. Um, and also with Angel, in which she's on the other side of it. She's, she's seen that the other side of love and it is disillusioned by it. And so Angel Olsen seemed the perfect person to do that. And the, the epigraphs that open, it's always a couple. I always try to have the epigraphs to do two things, right? Um, I think in the Fitzgerald book, it's, you know, there are no second acts in American lives. Um, and then the other quote from Fitzgerald himself again is, everything was just beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so in this one, it's, um, sometimes our enemies are closer than we think. And the second one is, shut up, kiss me, hold me tight. Um, so it seems like a perfect combination of where the one you know, contradicts the other. So yeah, I listen to a lot of her. I also listen to a lot of uh, Claude Debussy. I listen to a lot of that very limpid, impressionistic French piano music. And it sort of floated through the days as I was writing this, you know, that ocean state. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we sent her a copy of it, and she's like, thanks. <laughs> when, we, when we're talking about the, the women in, in uh, the novel, uh, sports is a very important issue for almost everyone. Um, one plays soccer, the other volleyball. Of course, baseball, uh, you've just told me, is, is, is your favorite, one of your favorite sports, and, and you wrote a book about it uh, with, with Stephen King. Um, how did you integrate the different kinds of sports? And uh, I, I thought it's, it's, um, it was very interesting that, that Carol is a Yankees fan and not a Red Sox fan. Oh, well, Bir Birdie. Birdie Bir is, is Birdie, well, Birdie's whole family yeah, yeah. are Yankee fans. Oh, Birdie, sorry. Yeah. And, that is, and that's yeah. typical. Mm -hmm. uh, culturally, mm -hmm. in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. um, the, the Portuguese, the Italian, uh, and the Dominican um, are all Yankees fans mm -hmm. because the Yankees very early on had Italian players and Dominican players and all that, whereas the Red Sox were more white. Uh, they, were, they were more racist in a way, um, and, and for years. Uh, so to, to provide the contrast between, say, Miles, the rich white boy, he's obviously going to be the Red Sox fan, whereas Birdie's family, the whole family, and they get it from their father, are diehard Yankee fans. Um, and the father, who's, who's dead, and is this present that sort of hovers over Birdie, the only things that are left of his are his Yankee hat and his Derek Jeter jersey. Um, and so the mother wears the Yankee hat while she's watching the Yankees playing the World Series and is rooting, cheering for them as if she were a substitute for the father. There. And they invite the whole family, the extended family, over to watch the Yankees uh, in the World Series, which was painful for me to write as a Red Sox fan. <laughs> uh, but in terms of the, the girls and uh, the young women and their, their, the sports that they play at the high school, um, that was more for me for one culturally it makes more sense for Birdie being Portuguese American to play soccer or American football uh, football um, and um, for uh, Angel she plays volleyball and that that sort of gives us that clue about her size she's just bigger um, she's and, and every time that, that Birdie sees either her or her friend she she remarks on how these these, just these big blonde women, these, these big basketball players and volleyball players, and it fits in because she's physically intimidated um, by Angel. She thinks that Angel's life is a life of ease the way that Miles' life is a life of ease. She doesn't know that Angel's life is, is very much more like her life, uh, but because they're rivals, she portrays her, she sees her as this, 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 this dangerous, hulking um, enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the names of the characters, uh, they, they are immigrant names, Alvis and Oliveira. Is that something that is typical for Rhode Island, or did you particularly integrate them? Well, it is very, very typical for Rhode Island there, very much so. Um, and the fact that, um, that both Angel and uh, Marie are part Portuguese, or basically half Portuguese, where Birdie is all Portuguese, um, is, is that that, uh, that almost strangely different caste system that, that American, uh, the American society has there. Um, because Angel looks more white, she's seen as white. 
Um, whereas Bertie is seen as Portuguese American and has and hangs out with her clique of Portuguese American friends who all speak Portuguese as well. Where Angel is white and monolingual and hangs out with the other sort of popular white mm-hmm. girls. Um, yeah, there's it's it's. It's kind of subtle in a way that it's built in there. It's not remarked on that much, even though Marie remarks on it in the very beginning. He says, "Here's you know what does what does that make me actually? If my father's mm-hmm. Portuguese, what does that make me? You know, never trust the Portuguese." Mm-hmm. Uh, so the question of who's who's in, who's included in America, and who's excluded, who's seen as outsider there. Um, if you're poor, you're outsider. If you're you know Portuguese, you're outsider. If you're non-white, you're an outsider there. Um, and Angel somehow portrays herself as being none of those things, whereas Marie fears that she is all of those things, whereas Bertie actually is all of those things. Okay. Let's follow. Uh, I don't know what, what to want to give away. Um, uh, Miles and, and Angel are, are finally caught by the police. Um, and then uh, the reader is, is, is introduced uh, he or she doesn't know it already, uh, the US legal system. And, and how important it is, uh, I think there's one sentence, in, in, especially in the Rhode Island, how important it is to know somebody. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and finances are a very important issue in the American legal system. Yeah, who can afford justice? Yeah, and uh, Miles coming from a very wealthy family can hire a firm of lawyers to take care of him. Whereas Carol has, again, very little resources. And she has, she has to decide if she's going to ask Russ, um, her sometime boyfriend, a serious boyfriend, if he might be able to help her, which is a position that she hates being in. She doesn't want to do this. She doesn't want to ask him. But she knows that she has to defend her daughter uh, at, at all costs. And so the, there's that question of, you know, will she follow her heart? Now, will she, will she you know, compromise to get money? What is she going to do? And how is she going to do it? And again, she has very few choices here. And, and she, she does her very best um, in an impossible situation. And, and once again, it's that the situation that comes up again and again in my books, you know, asking regular people to do impossible things. And, and they will try. They will do their very best. And, and I think Carol does her very best for Angel in the book. Um, and I think Angel understands that at some point. I don't know if Marie actually does, um, because I think Marie might be a little too young. Um, And that question of which two are, it's us against the world. Is it it Marie and Angel against the world, or is it Angel and Carol against the world? And Marie never can quite figure out that answer there. I've interpreted Marie as, as quite understanding, but still rather naive, and then uh, seeing her idol, more or less angel, her sister, disintegrate. Uh, and probably then she decides, or due to the circum- social circumstances also, to follow in her grandmother's footsteps. which Rather than in her mother's or an angel's. Uh, yeah. who's, who's the right role model yep. there? And she's never really liked her grandmother. No one likes the grandmother. Yeah. Um, and yet, well, not to give it away. No, no not, not to, to give it away. Too much. But. Thomas, is it possible that we ask Peter to read the very last oh. extract? Do we? <laughs> yeah, but you have to give it to me because there is nothing left here. Well, I can, I can start it. <laughs> I can start reading it. This is Marie again, and this is the night before Halloween, and Halloween being, of course, the night that Bertie disappears. Friday night is cabbage night, and Marie wants to pull a prank, but on who? Angel's at her dance, and her mother's off at the casino with Russ, so she's home alone, eating fish sticks and french fries in front of the TV, dreaming up mischief, soaping the windows of Mr. DeRosa's Mercedes, or pegging eggs at Mrs. Capuana's front door. Tomorrow she's taking Brookie trick-or-treating, which Marie knows she's too old for, but she still lusts after the free candy. And Sunday, Halloween will be over, so it has to be tonight. The problem is that no one lives on their road. 
She's explored the abandoned houses around them, but despite their broken windows and smashed sinks and holes punched in the drywall, she's never been tempted to vandalize them. And the mill is her haven, off limits. She's not interested in destruction, but revenge. For that, she needs a target and one close by. She could sneak down the road through the overgrown backyards and ding-dong ditch Mrs. Tidwell for never paying her, except, like her mother, she feels sorry for her. Plus, it's not the same without a flaming bag of dog shit. And where is she supposed to find dog shit? Technically, she supposes, she could use her own shit. If she wanted to walk two miles in the dark, she could toilet paper her grandmother's Japanese maple. But that seems like a lot of work, and her grandmother would have to hire someone to clean it up. It's easier to watch the ghost whisperer and imagine doing these heroic deeds. But eventually, the ghost whisperer ends, and Marie has to make a decision. Wie immer, wenn Langweile im Spiel ist, sucht sie den Kühlschrank auf. Ihre Mutter hat die Süßigkeiten für Halloween im Gefrierfach verstaut und Marie gebeten, sie nicht alle aufzuessen, denn Angel würde sowas nie tun. Marie denkt, dass es doch sicher in Ordnung ist, wenn sie eine einzige, in einer einzige der Tüten ein nagetierartiges Loch reißt. Halloween ist erst morgen und in ihre Straße kommt sowieso niemand, um Süßigkeiten zu sammeln. Also fischt sie einen kleinen Snickersriegel raus, stopft sich das ganze Ding in den Mund und steht kauend vor der geöffneten Tür, eine weitere Angewohnheit, von der ihre Mutter sie gern abbringen würde. Nach einem zweiten Snickers holt sie die große Flasche Wein ihrer Mutter aus dem Kühlschrank, überprüft, wie viel drin ist, zieht den Korken raus und führt sie mit beiden Händen an die Lippen. Der Wein ist kalt und säuerlich und übertüncht kurz den Geschmack des klebrigen Nougats, bevor er sich noch süßer wieder einstellt. Sie nimmt einen weiteren Schluck, lässt ihn im Mund hin und her gleiten. Ohne etwas dazu schmeckt er zu sauer und sie muss husten, verzieht das Gesicht und drückt den Korken wieder rein. Wie kann ihre Mutter davon eine ganze Flasche trinken? Marie stellt sie so hin wie vorher, das Etikett nach vorn und schnappt sich noch ein Snickers um den Geschmack aus dem Mund zu kriegen. Oben zieht sie im Zimmer ihrer Mutter die oberste Kommodenschublade auf und inspiziert die neue Unterwäsche, die sich ihre Mutter für Wes oder Russ oder für wen auch immer besorgt hat, den sie diese Woche beeindrucken will. Schwarz, Rot, Leopardenmuster, Trägerlos, Formbügel, Push-Up, Bikini, Slips, sogar ein Tanga, den sich Marie lieber nicht an ihr vorstellen will. Trägt sie dieselben Sachen für beide? Denn das wäre krass. Und wie viel hat all das gekostet? Ihre eigenen BHs sind Heftpflasterfarben. Ihre Unterwäsche wurde in Sechserpack bei Walmart gekauft. Sie zieht ihre Hemdbluse aus, nimmt sich den ganz oben liegenden Zebra-Muster-BH mit steifen Körbchen und posiert damit vor dem Spiegel. Ihre Mutter beklagt sich immer, dass ihre Titten zu groß sind. Jetzt muss Marie ihr beipflichten. Ihre eigenen sehen in den riesigen, formbeständigen Körbchen ganz mickrig aus. Im Spiegel ist sie mit ihrem vorstehenden Bauch der geschlechtslose Kloß, der sie ist. Und sie wendet sich ab, zieht sich wieder an und schwört, das nie wieder zu tun, obwohl sie sehr wohl weiß, dass sie nicht widerstehen kann. In Angels Zimmer ist sie vorsichtiger, weil ihr bewusst ist, dass dort Fallen lauern könnten. In ihrer Kommode oder dem Nachttisch warten keine Geheimnisse. Das sind die Orte, die ein Einbrecher oder die kleine Schwester als erstes durchsuchen würde. Sie geht direkt zum Wandschrank, sieht ganz unten auf dem Boden in der Ecke nach und widmet sich dann der Wand aus Schuhkartons, öffnet einen nach dem anderen und greift in jeden einzelnen Schuh, um sicherzugehen, dass da nichts reingestopft wurde. Sie ist geduldig. Angel hat immer irgendwas versteckt. Doch am Ende findet sie bloß eine Steinpfeife und einen Gasbrenner, den sie schon mal gesehen hat. Sie öffnet den Reißverschluss der nach Zeder duftenden Aufbewahrungstasche und durchstöbert die Taschen ihrer Winterjacken, aber auch da ist nichts. Die Fäuste in die Hüften gestemmt steht sie da und starrt auf die hängenden Kleider, die Wolldecke, die Milchkiste mit Angels Rollschuhen. Es steckt gleich im ersten Rollschuh, den sie sich vornimmt, ganz vorn in der Spitze. Ein Motorola Club Handy, das sie unverzüglich öffnet. Die Sprachbox ist leer. Eine Enttäuschung, es sind doch keine Kurznachrichten drauf. Keine kürzlichen Anrufe, als wäre vom Handy alles gelöscht worden, doch die Batterie ist halb aufgeladen. 
Ihr erster Gedanke vom vielen Fernsehen ist der, dass Angel mit Drogen dealt. Ein Geheimnis, das zu gefährlich ist, um es als Druckmittel einzusetzen. Marie schaltet das Handy aus, steckt es in die Spitze des Rollschuhs zurück und geht wieder nach unten, wo sie überlegt, was sie mit dieser neuen Information anfangen kann. Sie öffnet den Kühlschrank, um sich noch ein Snickers und einen Schluck Wein zu gönnen, tritt ans vordere Fenster und betrachtet den in der Einfahrt stehenden Wagen ihrer Mutter. Marie könnte sie anrufen und sagen, Wes sei draußen, er sei betrunken und wolle sich mit Russ prügeln. Doch das würde ihre Mutter nicht witzig finden. Was könnte sie bloß machen, ohne Ärger zu kriegen? Gerade zieht sie als mögliches Opfer ihren Vater in Betracht, als plötzlich auf der anderen Straßenseite vor der langen, fensterlosen Wand der Leinen Twine drei Schatten auftauchen. Drei Jungs in schwarzen Kapuzen-Shirts, in denen sie wie Ninjas aussehen. Sie bleiben stehen, stellen ihre Rucksäcke ab. Es ist eine Sprayer-Truppe. Zwei von ihnen schwenken in großen Kreisbewegungen ihre Dosen über dem Kopf und sprühen Graffiti, während der dritte Schmiere steht. Sie tritt einen Schritt vom Vorhang zurück, damit er sie nicht sieht. Im Dunkeln ist nicht zu erkennen, was sie da schreiben, nur wenn ein Auto kommt und sie sich zu Boden fallen lassen, kann sie kurz die gerundeten Outlines der Wörter sehen. Ihre Nicknames nimmt sie an, wie bei den anderen Bildern an der Wand auch. Doch der Gedanke, dass sie wie ein Überfallkommando vorgehen, macht es aufregend. Sie beobachtet sie, weil sie wissen will, ob auch der Dritte die Gelegenheit kriegt, sich zu betätigen und ist begeistert, als er tatsächlich loslegt und schneller ist als die beiden anderen, weil er mit beiden Händen sprüht. Als er fertig ist, sammeln sie ihre Dosen ein und verschwinden wieder in der Nacht und Marie wünschte, sie könnte mitgehen. In ihrem Zimmer zieht sie als Nachahmung lauter schwarze Sachen an, sogar schwarze Socken. Alle benutzen Duschgel bei ihnen zu Hause und so ist die einzige Blockseife, die sie finden kann, ein schmutziges Stück Ivory neben dem Waschbecken im Keller. Als sie die Treppe raufgeht, versteckt sie es in der Hüfte wie eine Waffe. Sie schaltet das Flurlicht und die Verandalampe aus und wartet, bis ihre Augen sich an die Dunkelheit gewöhnt haben, bevor sie nach draußen schlüpft. Die Straße ist leer, der Mond, schon fast voll, steht tief, sein blasses Licht wirft Schatten. Der Wind frischt auf, rüttelt an den kahlen Zweigen und Marie schleicht die Treppe runter, kauert sich in die Finsternis zwischen dem Haus und dem Wagen ihrer Mutter und lauscht. Auf der anderen Seite der Line and Twine plätschert der Fluss über das Wehr, unsichtbar. Nichts und niemand kommt vorbei, aber sie wartet, geduldig, wie ein Attentäter. Die scharf riechende Seife feucht in der warmen Hand. Neben das Vorderrad geduckt, kann keiner sie sehen und dieses Gefühl gefällt ihr. Nur weil sie nachts draußen ist, ist sie gefährlich. Ein Raubtier. In der Ferne brummt ein Motor und das Geräusch kommt langsam näher. Sie bückt sich noch tiefer, bis ihr Kopf fast den Boden berührt und lugt unter den Wagen. Hinten, bei den Tidwells, tauchen zwei Scheinwerfer auf. Ganz kurz befürchtet sie, es könnten Angel und Miles sein, die von der Tanzparty abgehauen sind und in Angels Zimmer rummachen wollen. Doch der Motor klingt tiefer, vielleicht ein Pickup. Wenn es Wes ist, weiß sie nicht, was sie tun wird. Wegrennen. Als der Abstand immer geringer wird und der Wagen auf der Geraden beschleunigt, gleitet das Scheinwerferlicht unter den Wagen ihrer Mutter, als würde es nach ihr suchen. Und sie setzt sich auf und versteckt sich hinter dem Vorderrad, den Rücken an den Kotflügel gedrückt, eins mit der Dunkelheit. Das Licht wird greller, der Widerschein fällt auf ihre Seite des Wagens und auch das Unkraut in der Einfahrt wird sichtbar. Ein Geflecht aus Schatten huscht über Veranda und Haustür und verschwindet, als der Pickup vorbeirauscht. Marie muss lachen. Sie will das nochmal machen. Sie könnte das Gefühl, beinahe erwischt zu werden, die ganze Nacht auskosten. Doch es ist kalt und sie hat keine Jacke an. Und als eine Kolonne von drei Autos vorbeibraust, während eins aus der anderen Richtung kommt, ist sie geschafft. Der Wind weht mal stärker, mal schwächer, der Fluss plätschert. Sie kniet sich hin und späht über die Motorhaube. Obwohl niemand kommt, schleicht sie wie ein Einbrecher um den Wagen und bleibt in Deckung. Mit einer Ecke der Seife schreibt sie in riesigen Buchstaben auf die Heckscheibe, sodass es von der Straße aus zu sehen ist, Hure. Die grausame Genugtuung ihrer Tat, die Wahrheit darin, ist zu viel für sie und hemmt sie. Falls sie das da glaubt, 
so ist sie nicht skrupellos genug, um es dem Rest der Welt zu sagen. Das ist kein Streich. Und bevor jemand vorbeikommt und es sehen kann, x sie die Buchstaben aus und verwandelt das Wort in ein abstraktes Muster, löscht dieses mit sich überlappenden Kreisen aus, wodurch sie einen schmierigen Tornado aus Seife erschafft und macht erst an den Seitenscheiben weiter, als sie sieht, dass nichts mehr zu erkennen ist. That's it.